Is this your last class for the day or do you have more periods after this? We have more. <laughs> oh my word. Okay. Let's see if I can give you another five or 10 minutes before the end of the session so you can actually have just a short, long, uh, a bit longer break between the sessions. Um, hang on there. Um, we definitely passed halfway point in this day already. So um, let's make the best of it um, and jump into chapter five. Chapter five, who, um, that we'll be dealing with specifically. Um, look to Daisy. Uh, chapter 5, um, right at the start of chapter 5, page 112 in the 11th edition, um, 11th edition, yes, you'll find that there are some forces um, that can affect this, um, the, the process of selling as well as sales management. Um, they basically come in three categories, behavioral forces, technological forces, and managerial forces. Um, the first part, half almost, of the chapter deals with each of those individually. Um, I'm not going to um, a, expect you to um, supply a diagram like this for me in, in, in a test or an exam. It is important, however, that you um, understand where specific um, factors, influencing forces um, are categorized, however. Most of it is quite straightforward, um, but let's look at some of those behavioral forces first. One of um, rising consumer expectations. We know that um, because, let me just get um, uh, right. When Alyssa is with us as well, I think um, um, what is important for us to remember is that because of the changing technology, um, um, products are being, um, the quality of products have improved. Um, people, by cell phones nowadays with functions um, that they probably never even use. Um, but more importantly is that because a certain expectation of a quality product has been set, that remains the expectation of the customer. Um, I often wonder if businesses um, sort of deliver substandard service because um, they want to gradually improve or they are scared that if they deliver at a very high um, level um, that they have to and they don't have that they don't have the capacity actually to repeat that because once you have delivered on a different level than your competitors that would be what consumers will continue to expect in future so obviously that's going to influence how you sell because um, if you, you can't undersell yourself if you have uh, over delivered in the past because the expectation has already been created there um, in the, um, for the consumer. You also find obviously that um, businesses have also become more efficient because of technology. So a lot of the influencing forces that you are dealing with um, sort of inter, um, are, are slightly interrelated um, because businesses um, have also become more efficient in what they are doing. It's not just on the buyer side um, that um, there's been a, a technological advances. Uh, it's also on the selling side. So both the buyer and the seller um, are more professional um, especially when businesses are doing business with each other. We also um, alternatively look at um, the expanding power of major buyers. Because of the competitiveness out there, um, to ensure that, you're, that, that, that the buyers select you as a supplier, very often um, the suppliers start um, start delivering specialized services to certain major customers or to certain major buyers. That can become dangerous because if that relationship then um, at some point um, um, goes sour, then you would have a problem. But again, it's a factor that influences how you would sell your product. 
Um, globalization, we know that um, a lot of businesses um, do business globally. Um, obviously, we have to, and we'll look at it, I think, in a later chapter, the next chapter, I think, when in chapter six, we're doing, when we're dealing with international selling, um, at the factors that we have to consider that influences um, global um, 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 global business or, because um, you have to be very wary of entering the international market. Um, although some businesses find that it's 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 very profitable, um, there are different um, um, ways that businesses approach um, international markets. Um, we we'll look at it in chapter six. Um, fragmentation of the market. Um, initially, let's say 20, 30, 40 years ago, it was quite simple. You can actually, uh, you had limited um, um, segmentation. Um, you could very easily enter a particular market um, and just offer two products, one for males and one for females. Um, but now within both those gender groups, you can also find subsections of sub um, 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 sections of um, of segmentation, and for instance, you can add age to it as well. It could be females um, under the age of eighteen, between eighteen and thirty-five, and over thirty-five. So already you have three sub um, um, market segments within just that gender segment. So it has become very fragmented and therefore businesses very often um, target very specifically um, a specific segment um, because they know that they um, would not overextend themselves, especially when you started a new business. It's much rather focus on fewer market segments and then eventually um, expand as your business grows. Technology goes without saying that it has a massive impact on um, on sales and on sales management. Um, the whole process has has um, has evolved. Um, we dealt with database management um, in the last chapters before we started with revision um, last week, um, where database management is is extremely um, helpful. Uh, and as a result of technology, more information um, is available to um, to um, and more detail on on specific customers is available to um, to the sales force. Um, it has made the whole sales process um, through sales force um, automation um, has um, has become easier to a certain extent uh, and more difficult in another um, easier to maybe do the selling because you have more information available you have greater technology available um, you can actually um, do more business but also it could be more difficult because um, of the expectations that um, that it now um, that the buyers now put on on the sellers that we've mentioned in um, in the first section the behavioral forces um, and <clears throat> also because um, the buyers are now better informed because they have access to information that they didn't have in the past. Um, makes it more challenging for a salesperson because they, they work with a better educated, a better informed um, potential buyer. Um, managerial forces, um, managerial forces, very much ties in with um, the um, <clears throat> business culture or organizational culture. <coughs> it will go hand in hand with the marketing philosophy or orientation that um, a business or the management of a business has decided on. Um, it will impact on what your marketing communication mix would look like. In other words, in other words, which um, different methods of communication would it be advertising? Would it be direct um, marketing? Um, would it be a combination? Would it be um, um, 
direct selling. Um, what would the best bouquet of um, of communication methods be to reach your specific selected target market? Um, <coughs> my apologies. I've been battling with sinuses and uh, it's cough for the last two days, but I'm fine. I think it's just the indication that um, my voice is also telling me it's long weekend. Hang in there, but take it easy. Just want to quickly page through chapter five and see if there's nothing else in particular that um, I think is of importance that um, I need to bring to your attention. There are obviously different um, distribution channels or marketing channels also that um, that um, we've looked at in chapter six. Um, there are four very distinct ones, and that would be, I'm just going to get to the right page in the textbook, but you'll find up at page 123 in the 11th edition. And that would be the direct one, where it's direct from manufacturer to um, to the to the customer or the end user, uh, very selective. They do that. Um, and, um, they um, distribute products or make um, some supplies, make certain products available only in specific regions or in specific branches of a, if it's an, um, a, a provincial or a, a regional or a national group. Um, very intensive. In other words, they. Um, ensure that they get or they want to get maximum exposure and because of that they make the product available anywhere not just in certain um, shops every single possible outlet that's available online and physically um, the product must be available that's if you have a very intensive um, um, marketing channel Right, let's look at, oh yes, also towards the end of chapter five, we look at um, um, uh, selling services, page 129. Uh, selling services, um, why didn't I include that in the slides? Um, it's important, but again, it's something that you have covered already in, um, <clears throat> in consumer behavior as well as in business marketing in your first year in the first semester this year. Um, the, the important thing to remember is that although the same principles apply, there are distinct differences between products and services. And therefore, when we sell a product, um, as opposed to selling a service, we have to be aware of the five very specific differences. Tangibility being one, a product you can touch, you can feel, you can smell, you can use your senses. You can't do that with a service. Also, a service you cannot take ownership of. When you buy a can of cool drink, it's yours. You can drink it or you can keep it till later on or you can sell it to somebody else. You can't do that with a service. You only have temporary access to the use of that service. Um, you cannot sell it to somebody else. You cannot um, send somebody else to the dentist if you don't like going to the dentist, but you have a toothache. Okay, you have the person with the problem is the person that needs to go to the dentist and make use of their services. Um, you also have a perishability, um, which means that um, um, the products um, can be uh, a product or a physical product can be stored and can be used later, uh, which is not the case with um, with service. The service um, has um, also different quality of service experiences um, on different days because we have the human element involved where product is pretty much the same, that kind of cool ring, if it's the first one or it's the one right behind him or the one right next to him on the shelf, they're exactly the same. Um, and the content is exactly the same. There's no intervention between you buying it and using it that affects the quality of it. Unless you keep, um, unless you actually 
obviously damage the product and then obviously it, it won't be the same. Service, unfortunately, you cannot store the service. You can't buy a ticket um, to fly from, from Cape Town to, to Dubai um, coming Friday um, because you want to go away for a long weekend and maybe extend it into a short break um, and stay away for another well, then they break and come back next weekend. And then on the last minute, you decide, nah, you know what? No, really, actually, we're going to stay home for the long weekend. I'll fly next weekend. No, if, if, if you've missed it, you've missed it. Then you have to buy another ticket. It's as simple as that. Um, <clears throat> so it's important to understand that the differences um, between products and services. There's one final difference, and that is the both. Um, in, in the case of a product, you can send somebody else to the shop to buy a product for you. Uh, maybe you run out of shampoo, but you're actually too lazy to go buy it yourself. But somebody else is going to the shop and just listen, just put that on your list, buy that for me as well. Um, I'll, I'll pay you when you get back or yes, money, go buy it. Um, you can't do that with a service. For you to experience the benefit of the service, like for instance, a haircut, you have to be there. You can't send somebody else to have that experience. Um, they'll cut that person's hair, but you won't, you, you still will be without your haircut. Okay, so basically the person receiving the service and the person offering the service needs to both be um, there for the service to actually happen. That's the end of chapter five. Those are the important um, aspects in, in chapter five. Um, towards the end, we've also looked at the exhibitions and, um, and, and stuff like that, but um, to me, that's not... Um, Exhibitions, I think it's um, the only aspects about an exhibition is um, I don't want you to, in event marketing and event management, you go into the layouts and stuff like that. Um, just, be, um, just be aware of the fact that an exhibition is a very important way um, for selling to take place because it allows you the opportunity to gather a lot of information and also demonstrate the products or services that you're offering. Um, and therefore, just go through um, that um, final section in Chapter 5 that deals with specifically um, the factors um, that make an exhibition um, um, a success. Right. Um, in other words, if you go to your textbook, um, Chapter five, page, oh my goodness, these pages are so thin and stuck together. Um, on page 137, there's a model of an exhibition communication process. It's in your, um, it's in your um, slides as well. Um, <clears throat> for me, it's just read through it and see what the process is, and you will pick up um, quite easily the different levels of involvement um, for sales in that whole process. Where selling specifically in that module um, um, appears in that model in different forms. Okay, selling is not going to get involved initially in the exhibition. It actually only happens once that stand has been erected and um, samples are there and people start coming through the door. Selling is not necessarily um, going to be too much involved. Marketing would be more involved in, um, in ensuring that people are informed that um, the exhibition um, will take place um, at a specific venue over certain dates. Uh, that's a more marketing effort than it's a selling effort, um, but uh, sales will actually only start when the exhibition actually starts itself, and then obviously the follow-up afterwards. When we go to chapter six, we deal with what we have on the screen. We deal with international selling. Now, how is that um, more challenging than doing business in your own country? Um, I think for reasons that we will identify and specific factors that we will identify and look at individually just now. But <clears throat> the main reasons why people go international is because very often, um, a particular product is not available in the country um, and um, therefore they start trading internationally. They import a particular product or a part of a product that is not available. Um, 
at their own location or within the country that they um, that they reside in. Um, it could be that there are differences in um, competitive costs. Sometimes it's better to import something than to actually um, build a new factory and produce it yourself. Um, and then obviously there's also product differentiations um, and that will be different from one industry, industry to another. Um, you don't have to go into too much detail, um, but you need to know that there are these three main um, reasons for businesses to um, do business internationally or to trade overseas. In um, the bulk of the chapter, we focus on the factors that um, have influence on or the factors that you have to consider um, very seriously when you do decide to trade internationally. Um, the cultural differences, we know that um, certain things and certain values and certain customs um, are different from one country to the other. You did that in your assignment now um, when um, the question was asked, question five, I think, to expand win worldwide to two more countries or suggest two more countries why and motivate why you have selected those countries um some of the aspects that you had to obviously consider are the cultural differences um some businesses or oh, some businesses some countries um um don't place that much value on skincare products for instance um and therefore their skin care range would probably not be um, not be um, well accepted in 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 that in those particular countries. Sometimes, um, not in the case of of one worldwide, um, the content and the process of manufacturing uh, is also not acceptable to to many countries. Um, for instance. Um, animals being used in the testing process of certain products. Um, people frown upon that, um, and rightly so. Um, so there are definitely there are different specific, uh, definitely specific cultural issues that um, has to be um, dealt with very sensitively. Language is the issue. Um, it specifically impacts on the education of the customer, um, especially when your product that you are selling comes with instructions. You have to ensure that those instructions are in um, in a language that is understandable. You'll find that most of these products that come with instructions nowadays have um, a pamphlet inside the box that basically gives you the instructions, step-by-step um, -step instructions in 10, 15 different languages. Uh, also be um, cautious of the fact that certain words mean different things in certain languages. Um, the aesthetics, certain colors um, and textures um, um, mean different things in different countries. Um, red, but um, and colors like black and white specifically um, mean different things in different countries and in different cultures. Religion is something that you obviously have to be aware of. Some um, in some countries, certain products um, need to be treated with a lot of sensitivity and care um, because of the um, requirements of a particular religion in that country. Um, education, the more educated uh, a particular country is or the population of a particular country is, the easier it would be to um, communicate with them um, um, and inform them and persuade them um, of the benefits of a product that you're trying to sell. Politics, impact on different levels um, but mostly um, I think for international business it relates to exchange rates 
um, and it relates to the costs and taxes and tax systems and different regulations within different countries. Uh, it's not the same for every country and we have to obviously adhere to the regulations in a particular country that we um, are considering to, um, to trade with internationally. Right, sales responsibilities. I think we are dealing with chapter seven now. I'm just gonna go through my textbook um, to chapter seven. Chapter seven deals with sales responsibilities and um, the preparation for you to make a sale. Um, we know that the main objective um, of um, um, of salespeople uh, is to conclude a sale. And you do that through identifying the customer's needs by presenting um, or delivering a presentation to them that um, informs them specifically um, of the benefits that that product would offer them. It goes hand in hand with a demonstration on how the product actually works, because that sort of emphasizes um, um, or highlights um, what you have said in your presentation. And when you do business with other businesses, negotiation um, and even with individual customers um, that buy expensive items, it might be that um, negotiation is part of the the whole process um, that makes uh, the final closing of the sale or that impacts on the final closing of the sale. In this whole process, obviously, somewhere between your demonstration and negotiation, um, you will find that there are some objections that are raised by, um, by the um, potential buyer that you have to deal with um, professionally and immediately. On page 180 in, in the 11th edition, you'll find that figure that you see on the screen um, that highlights the key responsibilities of a um, of, of salespeople. The whole process starts with a block in the top left corner, prospecting. Prospecting is a continuous process. Prospecting is not just going up there and finding potential buyers for your product um, or potential new buyers for your product. Prospecting is also a process that is continued because you will over time lose customers and you have to replace those customers. And they will leave for various reasons. We're not going to go into that in detail. Prospecting, a continuous process of finding new leads. Somebody, who, um, everybody out there um, doesn't have the potential to maybe buy the product that you're offering. Could be that they don't have a need for it, could be that they can't afford it. Um, so everybody, however, um, still maybe have the ability to become a prospect. But before you have qualified them, and see if they do meet the minimum criteria that's necessary to buy this product, they will be a lead. So a lead is qualified, um, and when they meet the criteria, they become a prospect, and the prospects are the people that you are going to focus your sales efforts on. Salespeople will always be focused on making a profit. You're always, nobody, um, I mean, as, 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 as a, um, um, a very re reputable um, salesperson in America once said, don't wait till you get to the objection stage and people say, oh, it's a great product, but you know what, it's, it's expensive. You should have clarified that right at the introduction, even before you started your presentation, because you're not going to make a profit. You don't want people who can't afford your, business, your, your product. So you have to be very, uh, um, um, very um, sure that you qualified your prospects correctly and from the start um, indicate to people that 
through the way in which you introduce yourself to the customer that they um, already um, that you have already a good idea that they can possibly do business with you because your intention is to make a profit um, and you don't want to get to that stage where they you've done the entire presentation and they're ready to buy and they're objecting about the price and negotiating a better price and you basically are giving your commission away um, and you're just breaking even just to make a sale that's not good because in the, in the long run you are going to then obviously not make a profit because that still remains the main objective of a it still remains the main objective of um of any selling transaction right oops a daisy jumping the gun on that one database and knowledge management very important um it's not files on cabinets and cabinets of files anymore information is stored um, in the electronic versions we've seen that in chapter 12 later on we're going to more detail about that um, database management we also did in chapter um, in chapter 10 and 11 um, later on which is not for the term test and um, it however still remains a key um, responsibility for um, any salesperson very difficult um, often Salespeople are people who are very driven. They are very, <coughs> my apologies, um, self-motivated, but um, they sometimes have um, challenges with managing their time. So you need to be able to, um, um, you need to be able to manage time very well if you want to be uh, successful in sales that's why it remains a key responsibility because time is um the your time is as precious as the time of the buyer that you are um that you're trying to sell to um their time is not more important than yours and yours is not more important than theirs time is the same for all of us we don't have enough time we do um and 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 we have to respect each other's time, but um, and there is no right time to call a prospect um, to maybe um, to attempt to make a sale to them. Um, if it's during business hours, you're going to infringe on their business. If it's after hours, you're going to infringe on the um, um, recreational leisure time. So there is no right time to actually phone. But you have to be persistent um, and obviously manage your time. And when you do make a sale, not go out and um and take a week off and celebrate um you have to repeat the process otherwise you will not make your targets and you would make what we have top um um in the block right at the top and that is to make a profit and in complaints it comes with the territory people are going to complain they're going to have legitimate and genuine complaints um and very often they have hidden um objections because um they don't want to offend you um, but most important um, to remember about dealing with complaints or handling complaints is to ensure that you don't take it personally. They might not be objecting and complaining about you. They might have object about the product or the fact that it didn't function properly. Don't take it personally. Make sure that you find out exactly what the problem is um, and pick your fights. Sometimes it's not worth the effort of going through the whole process where you could just have said, you know what, sir, I'm very sorry this has happened. Walk with me. Um, I'm going to um, have you just fill in um, a piece of paper for me. There's a process that we have to quickly go through. And then I'll immediately, before you leave today, I'll replace the product that you are happy, unhappy with. Sometimes that is the best way out. Relationship management um, is very important because um, if you want to create loyal customers eventually, um, you want repeat business, you want them to buy from you again and again and again. Um, and that will only happen if you have formed a strong relationship with them and if they are actually happy with you. Providing a service. Service is throughout the whole process. In other words, the manner in which the wholesale transaction happened. 
but then also after the sale has happened to ensure that they are still satisfied because that's how you build a relationship and retain them. Obviously, all of these activities that you as a salesperson are responsible for needs to happen within the um, marketing strategies of a business. Okay, you can't go off on your own and no, you have certain targets and certain um, objectives. The company has certain objectives that they want to achieve. You um, find that manifested in the marketing strategy um, and within the marketing strategy are your sales targets. Uh, and you have to meet them to ensure that your marketing strategy and um, works and therefore the company achieves the objectives. Factors that um, can improve um, the chances of your sales success. Know your product. Know specifically the benefits of the product. People are well prepared nowadays. They come prepared and therefore they will have the information because they Googled the stuff beforehand. You have to um, ensure that the information they have can be uh, aligned with the benefit that they can experience. And you will always focus on the benefit. They have enough information on the features. You have to know your product very well and especially the benefit that it offers the customers. You have to know your competitors. You don't have to spy on them, but you need to know what they are offering. If Pick and Pay is running a special this week, Spa, would need, spa needs to know what the special is. Maybe they can counter that with a um, not a, a special on the same product, but on a different product, for instance. Your sales presentation must be planned properly. And you have to set very specific sales objectives. Make sure that you plan for objections. Expect people to object and um, and um, and ask questions. Asking questions and objecting is just a request for more information. And also prepare that there's also always a possibility that they are not going to accept the product at the price as it is, especially if it's an expensive item. They will also, uh, and particularly if it's an expensive item, they will always try and get the best. You're not selling a house. I've never sold a house at full price. I've had one fortunate incident, but I've owned nine houses in my life, and only one of them, the the buyer actually said, "Oh, sir, you know what? I'm, I'm actually going to pay you ten thousand rand more. I just don't want to lose this house." But that doesn't happen. Usually, it sold slightly lower than um, than your price that you've offered, and the reason for that being is that um, people negotiate the best possible deal. We've reached the end of Wednesday. If we look at Johnny Depp there, we will see that it's not too long before it's weekend. We can almost see it on the horizon. So thanks very much again for your time. Thanks for, um, for the session. Um, I'll re upload the recordings this evening with the slides as well. Are everybody fine? Are you all good? All good, sir. Okay, then. Then we'll see each other tomorrow, um, seventh period. Are you guys coming into the campus? Or are you already somewhere off campus on long weekend or early long weekend? How is your campus activities look tomorrow? I don't think we're coming in tomorrow, so. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so either. I'll be here, but um, I'm pretty sure I don't expect any of you to be here. But uh, anyway, um, enjoy the rest of the day and stay safe. Um, take care of yourselves and we'll chat again tomorrow. Bye, sir. Bye, sir. Bye, -bye. Keep well, everybody.